Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the creation of my facade question and answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, The Creation of My Facade. Recorded on the 21st of May 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. I love you guys. <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty hard to talk to a group of people in this planet about what we've just talked about without most people having a big meltdown, to be honest. Yeah. And can you see, once you understand more about your facade, how it's a lot easier to have some compassion for yourself and also for others? Yeah. Yeah, it is. So, it's, a, it, it's a, such an important thing to understand the creation of your facade. So, what we're going to do now is just have some Q&A about that question, the creation of our facade. So, I'm open to answering your questions about it. If we come down to Talia down at the beginning, in the front here, and if we go back up to Dave on that side. <coughs> Um, so just in regards to your diagram, and mm -hmm. so you've got a person who's addicted to physical substances and they haven't engaged it for a couple of years or so, mm -hmm. so like where to now? They haven't released the cause or the pain. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, is it about now going to the terror and experiencing that? Or yeah, see, a person who's given up an addictive substance generally has... Uh, at least work through enough emotion to, to stop justifying the addiction to the substance. Mm. But most of the times they haven't yet dealt with the pain that causes the vortex mm. that needs the substance to satisfy it. And so you can see that they're still open to addictions of other kinds. And, and this is why many people do swap one addiction for another mm. uh, throughout their life. So the only real way to satisfy an addiction of any kind is to actually feel the pain that causes it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, it's unlikely we'll do that unless we get through this, mm. this uh, global terror of feeling any pain. Mm. And so the majority of people on the planet don't get through the global terror of feeling their pain while they're on Earth. Mm. And so they hit, hit the spirit world, they go through many years, most often trying still to get most of their addictions met until that becomes so painful to them. And you remember, every time they sin, there's more pain, there's more pain. And in the spirit world, it's really interesting, no matter what, it doesn't matter whether you're the worst possible sinner or the most perfect person, you are sensitised to pain the same amount. You want me to say that again? It doesn't matter whether you're the worst sinner or the, the happiest person in the, in the spirit world, you're sensitised to, to emotion of any kind the same amount. And what that means then is that every act that you take that's sinful has an instant pain. And so, you know, on earth we're in a lot of denial. So we're up here in a lot of... When we're in denial, the problem is we're very desensitised to emotional pain of any kind. In the spirit world, it's not going to be possible for you to be desensitised to emotional pain. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so what happens uh, for the majority of people on earth is that when they address an addiction of any kind of substance-based addiction, what they do is they have addressed at least their justification for it, which is great. You know, we, we always have justifying emotions that cause us to justify taking an action that is unloving to ourselves or others. So they've at least done that, but they have not addressed the underlying causal emotional pain that caused them to take the action in the first place. And to do that is going to require barging through this terror first and then getting to the actual emotion. 
And then the desire for the addiction no longer is there. You, you notice that most people who have a substance addiction of some kind say that they are addicts. They call themselves addicts. And in fact, the general AA way of handling it is to say that addiction is an illness or a sickness. Um, and the reason why they feel that way is they never get below this layer and so it, to them it's like this is always going to be there. Always, there's always going to be, I feel like having it. I've got to stop myself from having it, but I feel like having it. I stop, stop myself, but I feel like having it. So there's no longer the justification to have it, but there's still the feeling of wanting to have it. And when, I, when you address the pain, the feeling of wanting to have it disappears, which is a relief, as you can imagine. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just wondering, how do you experience the terror? Like, do you have to find things that would trigger it? Or Well, we'll talk about that over the next few days because obviously oh. it's a big part of our equation, isn't it? Yeah. So, so we're going to need to spend a bit of time on this, aren't we? You can see that. We're going to need to spend a bit of time on this particular part. So, so when we have the discussion in the next two days that follow you know, after the break, We'll be talking about governing emotions, and obviously this is a primary governing emotion. And we'll be also discussing the destruction of the facade, so which that's going to be all about, isn't it? Enabling somehow going through this global terror that we have of emotion, just allowing ourselves to experience that. Now, your celestial friends, like, they have a lot of compassion for your facade. They can see how it got created. They know it, how it got created. And they also have compassion for the fact that we're going to have to go through this seemingly terrifying experience mm. before we're going to be able to deconstruct the cause of our facade. So you could say that this is the cause of our facade. And this is the results of our facade. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. So th this is the cause of our pain and this is the results of our pain and this is the cause of our facade and this is the result of our facade. Thank you. Yep. So we're over here, Dave. If it's natural for us to feel pain, particularly as a child, yep. and, and we've created all this, what happened in our history that that it became unnatural, and, and is that a well, worthwhile question? Um, it's always natural for us to feel pain. It's a natural thing, and as children, every single one of us at some stage found it natural to feel pain. Does that make sense? Yep. So we need to understand that it's not a multi generational thing that all of us come up with this concept that you know years ago millennia ago we all decided not to feel pain the reality is every new child that is born into this world finds it natural to experience pain it's what happens after they're born usually but but even it's just after they're conceived there is reality but it's what happens in that formative period of our life from the time of conception to the time where we've now developed a, a sense of our own will, which usually only nowadays begins to happen well, you know, well after we're seven years of age and, and usually even into our teens or late teens. And um, it's during that period of time that we learnt this. So it's a, we need to see it as a learned thing. And anything that is learned can be unlearned. Unlearned. Yeah. Yeah. We also need to see it as a human creation. It's a human creation. It's not God's creation. So it is. This is. This is how we as humans have been functioning for millennia. But it's not God's creation of us. In fact, the child more closely mirrors God's creation. And that's why I said in the first century, become like little children to enter the kingdom of God. Right? That had many really strong meanings for you, that statement, become like little children to enter the kingdom of God. And one way you need to become like a child is how the child experiences pain is how you need to experience pain 
and it's quite simple and we've made it all so complex and so we have. huge. We have. But we need to see that the complexity is driven by this emotional barrier that's now within us. And it's within every person in, you know, on earth. It's an emotional barrier that we need to go through. And it's going to be a very cathartic experience when you go through it. And it will also help you connect to God for, for many of you for the first time. Yeah, and truly experience God for the first time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, who are we over here already? Nobody? Judd us. So we we'll come down to Pamela down. Down here. If you keep your hand up, Pamela. So. Far away. Yeah, I was just wondering um, if we're in our facade, are we um, not in our bodies in that moment? Um, remember, the facade now has become a part of your soul's will. So it's actually the facade is a part of your will and therefore a part of your soul's desire. So it's actually a part of your soul. Okay. And it needs to be removed. Uh, so it's not, uh, for many of you, part of the facade is to get out of your body, to stay away from how you really feel. But it is a soul-based feeling, so it's a little bit of rain. Mm. My washing. <laughs> <laughs> you understand, Jada, what I'm saying there? Yeah, I, th I think yeah. so. Yeah. So we need to we need to see that um, anything that has become a part of the way in which we exercise our will is really now a part of our soul. But but it's a part of our soul that we have created and therefore a part of our soul that can be removed. Yeah? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Now, remember the construction of the facade began with what we've been taught and then it began with what uh, then it continued with what we've taught ourselves. So it's both of those things. So it's, it was begun with our, in our childhood, in our formative years, with what we've been taught. Our parents, remember from their previous discussion, our parents' example of suppression, of fear, of emotion, fear of pain. They have a terrible fear of pain. They want to control pain. And then, of course, our parents decided not only to do that with them, themselves, which was their example that they portrayed to us, but also they decided to do it to us as well in order to maintain their own control of their own emotion. That's why having a child is sometimes one of the most traumatic experiences in a person's life. Because the, having a child frequently exposes in the parent a whole group of emotions the parent has never experienced before. Yeah. Because I've had a lot of control over experiencing them, whereas a child is now uncontrolled. And now triggering a whole group of emotions that the parents had never had never even thought they had. Yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question, or do you feel you feel a it's bit? Uh, I'm feeling weird actually right at the moment. That's so, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> You're allowed to be weird. <laughs> and if we go to Diane, I guess. I think so. <clears throat> now we're down at Pamela on this side. So sorry, guys. We're at Pamela. So you need your Yep, you've got Pamela, good. So I'm a little confused about this will. I think I just heard you say to Dave that the will isn't developed until seven, eight, nine, teenage years. No, no, remember in our first conversation with you, the, the last, the week that we've had before, mm. we said that the will was given to you as a gift even before you were conceived. Yeah. And, and the development of your will, your use of it, began at the time of conception and continues until now. So, so it didn't just begin when you were seven, but, mm. but it slowly was developed over that period of time. So it's not an instant thing where you don't have it one minute and you have it the next. Uh, but do, does the result of how parents regard and treat us, can that squash the will? Of course. Yeah. It has a okay. very large bearing yeah. on the exercise of your will. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I certainly felt I wanted to rebel and, like... Me. Yeah, Mo most parents do not educate their children about this most precious gift they've been given, the, mm -hmm. the use of their will. Now, can you think, as a parent, those of you who have been parents, 
have you ever had a conversation with any of your children about the use of their will? <laughs> Probably not, right? Because it's one of those things, you know, aside from when they're a bit naughty, you might just tell them say, you? <laughs> but, or you might punish them in some way, but but you've probably not sat down with them and explained to them the power of choice and decision and and this is something that we're just not been we haven't been educated mm. about the exercise of our will at all right but if we had have been most children understand it really well i found so so you can sit down with a child and and have a much easier conversation about the use of their will than you can uh, with an adult and have a conversation about the use of their will. Yeah. So as a child, having felt overwhelmed by the force of my parents' will over mine... Yes. Is that tied into my... It's not only that, okay. right? It's also because the child is so terrified of experiencing its own will because of the potential of what may happen to it in its own survival if it does. Yep. Right, so th there's a number of factors that contribute to the child suppressing its own will in favour of pleasing the parent. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we were over here, Diane. Um, just to go on from something you, in your answer to Jada. Yeah. Um, because certainly for me, when I had my children, all these things came up that I had no idea I had. Is it more intense for a woman? Or, you know, that you, all your emotions are exposed? Or is it the same for men? Um, men are just as capable as, of having intense emotions as women. God didn't create us partially in that regard, right? So in other words, a man is just as capable of having an intense emotional experience as a woman is. However, on the planet, men have been taught to embrace fear as a proof of their manhood. Where women have been taught to run away from fear as a proof of their womanhood. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, a woman is expected to feel afraid in certain circumstances and a man is expected to act for them under those circumstances. Now because of this pre-gender conditioning, m many women when it comes to experiencing terror have very large amounts of fear associated with the terror itself mm. and therefore are unwilling to experience the emotional overwhelm of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So unfortunately for many of you ladies, you've been preconditioned to believe more than a man has been preconditioned to believe that you are unable to cope with your own terror. Mm. Yeah. And as a result, your emotion about it is going to be more intense. Okay. Because of the preconditioning. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And is because um, a lot of that comes up for women, I think, after we've had children. Mm -hmm. Is that... Um, a big part of the postnatal depression? It's, it's a big part of many of the subsequent experiences after childbirth, including one of the things that many women do is they start exorcising, not exercising, but exorcising their fear through their children. Yeah. In other words, they start expressing and experiencing their fears through what their children now engage. And in fact, that causes the children to engage more dangerous activities in order to actually trigger their parents into addressing their fear-based emotions. This is why many women feel more afraid after they've given birth to a child than any other time in their life. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, if we go down to Diana and across to Kelly. So, so down to Diana on this side. <coughs> I, I don't really understand um, that it's natural for a child to feel pain. Mm -hmm. is, is, uh, can you explain that to me? Uh, um, do you, would you like some more examples, Diana? Uh, yes, or yes, please. Yep. Is it more like the cap they've got the capacity to feel it and when it comes, it's natural? Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but... Um, when, when a child gets injured, let's, as an example, 
what do you normally see the child do like when it gets injured they allow themselves to feel the result of the feeling of the injury which is cry yeah they, like so there's this pain in the injury yeah the physical pain of the injury yeah. and they just allow themselves to cry right and why they have the physical pain of the injury is because of emotional suppression from their parents already by the way but anyway, that's a subsequent, that's a side issue, which, which opens a whole other kettle of fish. Okay. So, so, but, but we need to understand that the, the child has a, has a natural ability to just cry the instant that it is pained. It does. But it depends on how much suppression has occurred by the parent as to the extent that it will allow these tears. So what you find happening within a very short period of time is at any time they have an emotion associated with pain, they are generally not allowed to feel it and therefore they are suppressed. But any time they have a physical pain, where an injury of some kind or an illness, they are allowed to express it. And this is why many children milk moments of illness and injury and disease. Because it's the only time they are allowed to actually experience their pain. Yeah, I'm starting to feel where I'm stuck with that yeah. understanding things. Yeah. So, so we need to see that that the child and and for many of you, one of your false beliefs, which which is, um, well, you know, like one of your denial techniques, I suppose you could say is to not face the truth that a child can feel pain right and is capable of feeling pain and is probably better at it than you are yeah. Yeah. and so quite frequently when we have children of our own we are so focused on preventing their pain which which actually teaches them what that they're not capable correct it teaches them they're not capable. definitely Yep. Yeah, my so, experience and so, what I taught. And women have been taught it more than men. This is why men engage in what you'd call dangerous sports more than women do. You follow? Yep. Because women have been taught that, that it's right for a woman to feel more frightened of pain than a man. Part of being a man and proving yourself is to go through pain and experience it. Part of proving that you're a woman is to feel that you're afraid of pain and have a man address it for you. These are all social conditionings. So don't think that they're a part of your nature as a woman or a man. They're just social conditionings where we've been allowed to experience certain things or not allowed to experience certain things. Yeah. So that some of my early desires. Yeah. To have fun doing a lot of different things like that that would just like take me out of this comfort zone that yep yeah were yeah most women are idea. far more afraid of physical sports and exertion and exertion this is why you know like even just things like riding a push bike or something that has speed involved in it you know most women are very conscious of the danger to themselves whereas most men ignore it because it's a proof of their manhood <coughs> right most women accept it because it's proof of their womanhood right but none of it is manhood or womanhood it's just emotional injury that's all yeah yeah a person who loves themselves is fully conscious of every action they take and the potential dangers of every action they take but they are not afraid of every action they take you follow yeah i i mean doing things like when you just said riding a bike like as a kid i used to love doing that but i couldn't do any of those things around my mother or father it was well because like they're afraid of they were afraid something so, happening to you yeah? so there's this link i'm feeling about. exactly once you disconnect the link yeah. of the fear of your family fear of your parents which is a lot tied up in these global emotions you, you can actually feel like is this my fear or was it their fear or Am I afraid of it or what? Now, a lot of times their fear, remember every time a fear is projected at you, it is when, is when they did not love you. 
And remember I've said to you many times in the past that every time love was withdrawn from you, this was a terrible pain to you. So, so you've learnt that every time somebody's afraid, they're going to withdraw love. Right? And that's going to cause you a lot of pain. And so now we have a psychological association emotionally between the feeling of pain or the feeling of fear and somebody and feeling pain. And so naturally, we are, this creates part of our global aversion to feeling pain of any kind. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank feeling you. fear of any kind yeah. uh, in particular. Yeah, thank you. Mm. So, yeah, for each one of you it will be a little different, but the reality is every one of us on the planet have this global aversion to feeling terror regarding pain. So feeling the emotion of terror mm. about emotional pain. Right? So the, ir the irony is that it's not the actual pain that we're so afraid of. <laughs> It's the emotion of terror about the actual pain that we're afraid of. And th that has been constructed because there's where our life was threatened in that area. So this is about survival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we learned that feeling pain will cause the attack of the general community upon oneself. And when a general community attacks oneself, then your life is at risk. Right? So now your very survival's at risk. Yeah, it felt like that with my mother mm. and the physical attack. Yeah. 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 You. Do you notice too a lot of men make fun of women's fear? Have you noticed that? Yeah, it's just interesting. They make fun of women's fear, but they'll do anything to help a woman avoid it, <laughs> ironically, because that's their proof of them being a good man. Most women believe that a good man is a man who makes them not feel any fear, is a man that makes their fears go away. Right? A lot of men are not attracted to a woman who is able to experience her own fear because then he's got no role, no sexual role with her. Right? Interesting too. A lot of women are attracted to dangerous men for similar reasons. There's uh, all sorts of things that we could say about those kind of issues, but <laughs> let's go to uh, Ben. We were over Kelly on this side though, so let's go to Kelly. Uh, it just leads pretty much on from Dyer and the survival instinct. Mm -hmm. So somewhere that kicks in, did you say, when we were children and that it actually Honestly, helps us? Honestly, yeah, for the majority of us, if we did not engage the facade as we were taught to do by our parents, we probably would not have psychologically survived. And we certainly, for many of us, would not have even physically survived. So you said it was a good thing that yes. we did that and took on the facade. Yeah, well, you needed to, to survive. So it wouldn't have I'm been... I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's, I'm saying in the way society has been constructed at present, it was the only way you could survive. Oh. So let's be easier on yourself for its construction because it was the only way you could actually survive your own childhood. And was that a willpower choice? That was a will choice. Will choice. Yeah. You re recognised that if you had didn't do it, you would receive additional pain. Does oh. that make sense? Mm. Through threats, blackmail and other things, you would have received d additional pain. So you recognised as a child that, that you had to do something different. Yeah. And to do something different was accept what your parents wanted you to be. Once you did that, a lot of the pain goes away, seemingly. Mm. The pain doesn't go away, of course, it's just future pain. You know, you're avoiding future pain. And, and, and of course, you're avoiding it. And remember, at this stage, you're not developed in love. You don't know about love and what's loving from God's perspective and what isn't. You only know about what your parents have taught you. That's all you know. You, know, you, know, you, you haven't had the opportunity... And there's certainly no education on this planet about what God's love is all about and what love really is. So you had no opportunity to learn that during that formative part of your life, you had no opportunity to learn what God's definition of love was. So what other choices were open to you? Not many, huh? No, if you had some guides maybe or... Well, many times your guides yeah. were trying to help you, but 
but of course they were working against the opposition from mm. the rest mm. of humanity and society and your parents pretty hard to work against that for a child for the child the pressing thing is going to be avoid any potential danger coming from the most closest people in their life that that's the main imperative so of course so they'll, they'll probably listen firstly to the demands of the parent and the demands of society yeah so then we've held on to that yeah that, that's their problem isn't it yeah. we're holding on to that yeah. We're justifying holding on to that. We don't have any faith it can be any different. There's a lot of problems we have mm. now as a result of that. Which are, and, and a lot of our life's difficulties and problems and our life's current pain is caused by that. Mm. Like we, we need to see that it's the choice we're now making that can be changed. Right? But we need to have some compassion. Have some compassion for oneself. And others too, you know. And others too. It's a it's a very difficult thing, a harsh thing that's occurred here, and uh, and if we're going to ever address it and undo it, it's going to take quite a lot of concerted effort on our part, and we need to have some compassion for the fact that it's how it's created and why and why we did it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not saying that we let ourselves off the hook for not addressing it. I'm just saying we need to have some compassion for how it was there. Yep. And we're over at Ben. Jen will be the next one here. <coughs> just following Diana as well. My little girl is seven years old. and mm -hmm. uh, In the last few weeks, we've been doing a lot of bike riding and yep. going down a lot of long, very fast hills. And I'll follow her. And she's like shaking in any second. And I'm freaking out behind yeah. her. Yeah. Is that me feeling my terror? And not in putting it onto her, because I just want to yell out and say, Duh, slow it out, but I don't and just freak out. Yeah, no, it's good that you do that, but you've got to realise that most women have, from their mothers, <laughs> um, a lot of multi generational fear about these particular things. So, so while you're freaking out about, about her, her uncertainty, her freak out is about something completely different. The child? Mm -hmm. Okay. But that, in, in relation to my feelings, when I'm doing that behind her, am I feeling my... Well, it doesn't help her, does it? It's, it's projecting more fear that she potentially is going to fall and you're afraid of her falling. So, so projecting that at her causes her to fear even more. So what do I do with my feeling in that situation? Well, you, you remember that every time you fear for her, you, you are withdrawing your love from her. So she's feeling that. So, so my suggestion is... Imagine the very worst that could happen to her and have a good cry about it okay. and, and understand that she's not even your child. It's God's child and God will protect her and look after her no matter what happens to her. And then I won't have that feeling when she's skating down the hill. Yeah, but also you need to educate her about how to use the right. bike and, and so forth. So that's part like of the that. role. But it wouldn't be done in fear. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Jen? Could you tell me, please, what is the difference between compassion and self-pity? <laughs> yeah, sure. It's very similar to the self-reliant and, uh, and self-responsible discussion, so let's look at it. Okay, you tell me. Remember? With the self-reliant and so and self-responsible discussion, one was a list of whole, whole heap of things that were really false beliefs, weren't they? And the other was a whole list of things that were really about God's truth. So, how do we see and analyze this one with the same technique? Do you think? Let's look at self-pity. What kinds of things are a part of self-pity? You go, Sess. Maybe you want to answer, Jen. Far right, oh, you, sorry. Can, you can if you want. There's an aspect of poor me. Okay, and, and, and is that true? And, and vic victim. Yeah, victim, yeah. And what is over here? What's compassion? What, what's the truth? Well, this poor me thing, what is the truth? Well, you might not be okay. You might have pain, right? 
right? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? You see why we confuse these emotions, right? Any ideas? Well, what's humility? What, what's humility? Humility is the desire to experience any emotion, isn't it? Right? So if we analyse the desire to feel any emotion, um, what, what do we get out of that? The poor me is an emotion of what? Isn't it basically an anger-based emotion? Isn't it really just saying, I shouldn't have to deal with that because I've had to deal with all this terrible crap in my life and... And, and I'm just going to try to avoid all that, isn't it? Isn't it a desire to avoid emotion, really? By wallowing in a feeling of, oh, I've had so many bad things happen to me, it's so terrible, it's so bad. Are we really feeling any of those bad things in that moment? We're not, are we? We're, we're, just, we're just putting a global wrapper around it all and saying I shouldn't have to feel about all that, aren't we? Yep, so it certainly is the opposite to humility, I have to agree. But let's be more specific if we come to Deidre. <coughs> um, the opposite of that might be I'm one of God's children and I can cope with anything. Yeah, I am the highest of God's creations. Yeah, what a contrast. Okay, to have real compassion for yourself... You're going to have to have that view at some point. Yeah, what a contrast between poor me and I'm the highest of God's creations, isn't it? It's a big contrast. Yeah, what else? Victim. Victim. What's a victim? Now, let's uh, probably define the word better, shall we? Because uh, the reality is if you can be a victim of a crime, and that means that the crimes happen to you, right? So, so the reality is, <clears throat> to every single person, there's crimes that have happened to you. That's the reality. <clears throat> what does it mean to be a victim, though, when we use it in a negative context? Yeah, going to Shula over the, up there. Does it mean that you're helpless? You can't do anything about it? Yeah, you sort of believe in all of this false beliefs about powerlessness and... You got no. There's no way you can do anything about it. There's no way you can overcome it, isn't it? And that, and that's, and that, and we, and we use that in a negative term to be a victim, sort of thing, don't we? What what it means to be a victim. So here, we what we're really saying is that we're powerless. What else? I can't change. Um, either we deserve it. Or we want to blame others, yeah. Okay, now let's look at a person who has compassion. <laughs> there is a big contrast, isn't there, again? A person who has compassion feels I'm powerful, I can change. I didn't deserve it, but I can deal with it. Don't they? Isn't it completely different? Yeah, almost opposite. Hmm. Okay. And what I've just taught you in those two analyses is what? That you can analyse almost any emotion and see whether it's out of harmony or in harmony with love. Can't you? There you go. That's a good thing to know. <coughs> Where are we up to... Uh, on this side, where were we? Oh, we had nobody um, chosen yet. If we come down to Karina, yep. And then on this side, uh, we were... Let's go Teresa. Thanks. Um, AJ, some of us have more facades than others. Uh, that true? Well, yeah, I, I think it's true sometimes. But I don't know, it's like... There's certain preferable areas where some of you have facade and there's other preferable areas where others have facade. It's almost like... Um, and, and I'm almost questioning as well, Karina, why you want to measure it. It's 
not like we're in a competition of who's got the best facade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, follow? I beat myself up for a few years because I believed I had a lot of facades and today's talk's just um, been fantastic because I've seen... Yeah, I agree, I you do have, have a lot of that. facade. But, but can you see, if you're not careful, you might say, well, I have more facade than they do, so, so I should, it should be, I should have more allowances made for me than they have. Can you see, if you're not careful, you can then use it as a justification for badness. And I'm not suggesting you do that. Mm. Can you see? Yes. I have another question about it. Sure. Um, can I, can I just pause though before oh, you ask the other question? Yes. I Did need I you to respond re to receive that. <laughs> to have heard receive that. <laughs> what I just said. Not to use that to make allowances. Because that's your tendency. The reason Thank why you. I bring it up is that it's your tendency. Your tendency is, well, I've had worse things happen to me than other people have had. So that now justifies me holding on to those bad things that have happened to me. It's a, it's a, it, it, if, you're, if you're not careful here, you can use the, what's happened to you as a blind for your own badness. Do you know what I mean by that? As a hide, hideaway for your own badness. Mm. A, way, a way to justify you not addressing an issue. And that's not what I'm attempting to do here. In mm. fact, a person who has true you know, acceptance of their facade does not justify their facade. Mm. They have an imperative to remove it. So you've got to be very careful with this discussion that you now don't go and justify your facade, which would be a sin in itself. It's like justifying the creation of sin with more sin. And that's no good for you. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Okay, go for your second question. Oh, well, I, as I was feeling this in myself, I was thinking about my sister who felt she was very loved and she seems to have just, she felt loved, everything was perfect. For, uh, and for myself, uh, the opposite, feels like I've had a lot of facades and she hasn't had to have very many. I can't agree. Often a person who is loved by her parents is often being more what her parents want than the other and therefore has a stronger facade, right? And okay. therefore will find it much more difficult to give up than the other person. Okay. Mm. And then the last bit was different types of facade. I don't know if facade. you heard the answer oh, then okay. either. <laughs> okay, sorry, receive that. You're just skipping over these receive answers. Receive that. See, these, these answers trigger you and, I'm, and, I, and I need to say to you why. And that is mm. because you've sort of, you, you do have almost a self-pity attitude to these yeah, things. I do. You do. And, and this self-pity attitude is justified by your own feelings about everything. When I, when I sort of feel about your family, the reality is, yes, you were not approved of and that was very hurtful and you have a, a fair bit of pain associated with that. I agree. However, that doesn't mean that your sister is going to find it easy to become at one with God because your sister has, has absorbed what, she, what her, your parents wanted her to be and has become it. And that means that in order to become what God created her to be is going to be probably even more difficult than you're finding it. So you've got to stop having this self-pity attitude mm. about what's happened and start seeing that actually not everything is like you're assessing it currently. Yes. Do you see? Thank you. Yep. It was the last bit. Um, I feel that a lot of my facades were about um, unloving to other people because I was trying to overcompensate and so they're more externally um, projecting type of facades whereas I'm feeling into if other people have facades that are more internalised uh, shutting down on themselves or being um, unworthy and stuff is a bit like the question about if you're feeling superior to someone or you're feeling inferior, are they equal? Um, Honestly, Karen, I feel it's a bit more complex than what you're trying to make it. The reality is with each individual circumstance, 
there are different things that have been created. Do you understand what I mean by that? So, yes. so, so if I can ex give an example, um, your the treatment of your sister, your sister was more more in line with the heterosexual version of what is right, right? Yes. Right? Whereas you're a gay soul, so you're more in line with the homosexual version, you know, like in sense in the sense that from what's right for your soul is to is to be homosexual if you're a gay soul. And what I and what I'm suggesting to you is that your sister like has not had a whole area of confrontation in her life between herself and her parents as a result, whereas you have. Now, you have a lot of self-pity about that, but actually she is probably going to find it harder to address that than you because you've had to address that most of your life. You follow me? Now, that's one situation, but then there are many others that are different to that and, and you can't just make a global assumption about how you're inferior or, or superior or about how you know certain things have happened to you and certain things have, have happened to others and this is why you feel certain things without first going through the emotional experience of remembering those events and and I put to you um, you're trying to avoid the pain of the emotional experience of remembering those events so at this stage, your analysis of the truth of these particular things is not going to be very accurate. The truth will only become known fully to you when you experience the painful emotion. Right? So what I suggest to you is to stop comparing. In every question that you've asked me, you're, you're doing this comparison. In this case, with your sister, or some with some others, you're comparing, you're comparing, you're comparing. This is an addiction to compare. And you're using the comparison as a way of justifying you not dealing with specific things. And, and I feel, no matter what has happened to you and how bad it is, you might have been tortured for 30 years, right? which you haven't been, but you might have been, and I would say to you still the same thing. You still need to address the pain of the emotion. Do you follow? Yep. And, and, and that being w willing to do that is going to open your heart to God and God can help you then. Now, if you don't open your heart to God and you're not willing to do that, then God can't help you. You've got to do it all yourself then. And I, I'd, I'd much rather recommend to you that you do it with God's help than do it by yourself. The main reason why the majority of us do not want to address this is because we believe we're going to have to do it alone. You do. You assume that, right? And, and that's one of the reasons why you haven't addressed it, because you assume that you're going to have to do it alone. No, God wants to help you deal with that. He knows that the world's like this. He knows this emotion exists within you. He's already holding your hand. He's already suggesting to you that you can address it, right? You just don't want to address it. And while you don't want to, he can't do anything more. He can't. You need to allow him to, right? And justifying self-pity is not going to allow him to. You follow? Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, well, one more question and then we're done. So, Teresa? <coughs> um, the thing about the, the kids, the children, um, and I'm, I'm thinking about my 11-year-old daughter mm -hmm. who... Um, I feel like I'm more um, I am more okay with her hurting you know hurting herself falling over and stuff than my husband is yep. and I feel like I'm um, trying to overcompensate for him and in, in that I feel like he coddles her more than I do so I, I feel like I'm maybe I'm being a bit harder on her mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what I'm wondering is, is it actually make is that making any difference apart from damaging her be, being if I'm being harsh? Um, Isn't that a fairly big thing, Teresa? <laughs> you seem to dismiss it quite readily, but it's a fairly big thing. A mother I, being harsh isn't isn't it going to make her gravitate more towards daddy than she already is? 
There's a difference yeah. between harsh and truth, isn't there? Yeah, I, well, I, may, I don't know if I'm being hard or being truthful, like um, saying... No, this. I feel you're being hard, okay. <laughs> certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had that feedback with my son as well. Can, can you feel your resentment of your daughter? Yes. Uh, what's it caused by? Can mm. you feel your husband's attitude towards her? Yeah. What's her his attitude? He tri he's his, she is his princess. Yes. So you're not. You're not his princess. I well, I think he treats me like a princess as well. No, but he he views her as more his princess. Okay. He 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 is he the the issue you have is that he is actually emotionally has an emotional incestuous relationship with her, your daughter. Mm. Anything that you don't supply, he tries to get from her. You follow? Yeah. This makes you more angry and resentful, which then encourages your own treatment of her to be to to blame her rather than sort out your problems with him. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Which you do, right? You avoid sorting out your problems with him. Um. Okay. I. I th well, I th you don't even I see it as a problem, do you? I do talk to him about stuff. Yeah, but you avoid sorting out the problem. There's a difference between talking to a person about their problem and sorting out the problem emotionally. Follow? Yep. To sort it out emotionally requires both parties to go through emotions. Both of you don't do that when you're sorting out these problems, do you? He doesn't and you don't. You're angry, yeah. so you're not sorting out your emotion. Yep. And he feels resentful of you bringing things up, so he's not sorting out his. Yeah. So the activity is going to continue, is it not? Until I, f well, I can only do what I do. I can only feel. You can, you yeah. can, yeah. So what do you need to feel is the question. My reason, well. So you, you, you questioned your behaviour about uh, with regard to your daughter. Yeah. And I'm suggesting to you that there's an underlying anger that you have with her. And the anger is triggered by the fact that your husband demonstrates more favouritism towards her than you. I think I've also deliberately made him do that. I feel as well. I don't. I push him away. So of course you do. Yeah. yeah. Which is also why you've put on weight and so forth. It's all about pushing a person away sexually yeah. and emotionally. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So wouldn't it be better first to address those issues? The pushing away. Yeah. See, that, that is terror, isn't it? You're doing it because you're terrified of something, terrified of emotional intimacy. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to find the source of that terror, what's going on with that terror and feel it. Yeah. 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 And that will help alleviate your feelings towards your daughter and him in their relationship. Do you follow me? Yeah. Yeah. And that's independent of what he does. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But if it was me, I'd certainly also be raising the issue with my partner and saying, well, you know, you've got an emotionally incestuous relationship going on with our daughter here. That's not going to help her either. But also your resentment of your daughter is not going to help her either. Mm. Yeah. How does it relate to my son, the relationship I have with him? Well, can you see that in most families where there's two children of different genders, it's highly likely that the mother will connect with the son more than the daughter and the highly likely the father will connect with the daughter more than the son because of the emotional holes that the father and the mothers have. Yeah. Okay. The emotional holes are like vortexes and the, the, the person we train to meet them, meet these vortexes of neediness, are the opposite gender child. You follow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you remember... Um, I don't know if I would say that, actually. I want to raise an issue, but I'll do it with you privately because I feel it's not appropriate to do it in a group. But I feel that there's been many times when men have projected at you uh, sexual approval emotions and you've accepted them f freely and you actually think those men are nice men, right? But at the same time, you're avoiding emotional and sexual intimacy. So obviously there's a hole there. The vortex that gets fulfilled through the projection, but but 
but not through the act. Mm. You follow me? Yeah. And no, actually, no, I don't. No. Yeah. No. And in fact, when I raised this issue with you a few years ago, there was a certain person who I, you know, I don't feel I should mention, and there's a certain person who did that with you, and you thought that person was a wonderful man. And he actually uses sexual feelings towards women in order to control and manipulate them, right? But you thought it was wonderful. Mm. And, and, you know, th this is a part of the issue that you create with your son and your, f and your husband with his daughter. Mm. Do you follow? The things that you don't get met in the relationship are now met by a third party who's a child trained to meet those particular addictions. Mm. Anyway, I we can talk more about okay. it at another time, I think. Because okay. you, you're not hearing what I'm saying and, and you haven't heard the previous conversations I've had with you about the subject either. A few years ago, I had a conversation with you about a particular person. I don't know if you can remember. I don't remember a particular person. Mm. I know of a person, but... I don't mm. think we had a conversation about that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Mm. It's easy to avoid the comments that I say while we have the yeah. all in place. I've noticed how much terror distorts and um, yeah, just completely makes everything inaccurate. Yeah, but you would you rather you'd rather feel that you have terror than you rather feel that you have anger. Yes. And I've talked to you about this a number of times. How you actually have anger to feel rather than terror to feel so much. Right? Of course, the anger is driven by terror of some kind, yeah. but you need to first feel what's there. And this is where, when we talk about the deconstruction process, mm. that might help you, because it, you know. While all this is going on, which is what's going on for you, all this stuff's going on, you either get angry when you know you don't get your addictions met or you feel comfortable when your addictions do get met. That's what's going on for you mostly. And so wh while that's happening, do you think you're ever going to find this? No. The answer is no. no. You're not. And that applies to everyone here in the audience. While, while the satisfaction of your addictions is going on or the dissatisfied addictions of being projected as anger and rage towards the world, while that's happening, you are not getting any deeper. You won't get any deeper. It's impossible to get any deeper mm. emotionally. And it's like anything that anybody says to you about what's below this will have no effect on you whatsoever while that's occurring. Does that make sense? So I would recommend you focus on these things that are going on rather than trying to access this stuff down here that at this stage you have no desire to access because you're in this cycle here. Do you follow? You're in the addiction cycle. Mm -hmm. So you remember the talk Mary gave uh, in 2014, I think it was called Introduction to Addiction. My suggestion is go back to that, Teresa. Okay. Yeah, and have a look at that talk in the cycle, the frenzied cycle of addiction, because that's what you're in. Yeah, And it's pointless trying to access this while you're in that. You've got to stop that. But that is an exercise of your will. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Only, only you can do that. Nobody else can do that for you because it's your creation and it's what you're maintaining yourself. And even my words to you have had no effect. So, so that tells you it must be fairly resistive to seeing this cycle that's going on. Do you follow? Yep. Yep. But remember, I have compassion for that place. You've got to learn to have mm. some compassion for that place. Yep. Mm. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good day. Well, that's uh, it for today, I think. We've uh, exhausted that. Well, I don't think we've exhausted that subject. We've probably barely. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. I don't, I don't think we've exhausted that subject. We've probably barely scratched the surface, the reality is. Um, but uh, tomorrow we'll be focusing your attention more on accepting the facade. Remember there's also a, uh, there's a feedback sessions as well. So you may, the two pink folders up the back 
uh, if you want to put things on there to get some feedback about these particular subjects, either the pain, the facade, or tomorrow's subject. So you might want to listen a bit to tomorrow's talk in the morning first before you fill it out about accepting the facade. And we can uh, then address some of those issues in the feedback session we do in the afternoon tomorrow. Does that sound good? Good day. Remember to leave your drives that are not for, uh, done yet on the right hand side. And I will leave the drives that have been completed on the left hand side of the back of the hall. Thanks for your time today, guys, and we'll see you tomorrow. 11 o'clock tomorrow.